Welcome to the course of really hard accounting. In this course, we're going to tackle some of the hardest sections in accounting standards today. And in this first module, we will tackle how to account for equity investments. And to do this, allow me to tell you a short story about a friend of mine, Bob. My friend Bob just happened to come into a lot of money, a million dollars to be exact. Bob has decided to become an activist investor using his winnings as seed capital for his investment company. Bob incorporates Parent Corporation, or PICO, by purchasing newly issued shares for $1 million. Bob is our only shareholder. Using PICO as his investment vehicle, the million dollars is used to purchase four equity investments. And let's look at each of those now. The first investment PICO made was a $300,000 investment in ACO. This represented 1% of the issued and outstanding shares of ACO. Bob sees this investment as a trading position and hopes to sell it for a profit in the near future. PICO's second investment was in BICO, a small capitalization public company. The $400,000 invested allowed PICO to acquire 15% of the issued and outstanding shares. Bob sees this as a core investment that will be held for a number of years. PICO's third investment was SECO, a private company in startup. PICO invested $100,000 and was granted a 25% ownership stake in the company. Once again, Bob thinks that this will be a longer term investment. Given the size of his ownership stake in the company, Bob expects that he will be actively participating in influencing the strategic operating, investing, and financing direction of the company. At the date of acquisition, the net asset value of Seco was $360,000. The difference between the price Pico paid for its shares and the underlying net asset value has been attributed to fixed assets with a five-year life. Finally, PICO invested $200,000 in DECO, another private corporation. This investment gave PICO 10% of the issued and outstanding shares. Now Bob thinks this investment is likely to be a long-term investment as well. And so went the first year of operations. The year-end results came in, which Bob studied very carefully. Bob summarized the results of each of the investments onto the table presented here. And each of the investments showed positive returns, both in terms of the income generated by the company, as well as the dividends PICO received. ACO and BICO also appreciated in value, which Bob was able to track from publicly available trading prices of the shares. Because SECO and DECO are privately owned, it is unknown whether PICO's investment appreciated or depreciated in value during the year. Bob used a crude measure to calculate his return on investment. By multiplying PICO's proportionate entitlement to each company's net income and comparing that to PICO's investment base, Bob estimates that PICO's portfolio of investments earned 10% during the year. Feeling pretty good about that result, Bob wrapped up his analysis and gave it to his accountant to confirm his calculations and to prepare financial statements. His accountant looked at each of the investments in turn using the information provided by Bob. Now ACO was designated as a fair value through profit and loss investment given Bob's intention to trade. The readily available fair value information and the relatively inconsequential level of PICO's ownership stake in ACO. This classification, as its name suggests, records any changes in the fair value of the investment as income. In addition, dividends are also reported as income. Thus, for accounting purposes, PICO report the income before taxes of $30 related to this investment, $15 from the appreciation in the value of the investment and $15 related to the dividends received. BICO was not purchased as a trading investment. Thus, 
His accountant chose to classify this investment as available for sale under IAS 39. And in the future, under IFRS 9, it will be classified as a not held for trading investment if, if Bob wishes to so elect. Like the ACO investment, the BCO investment will be carried on the balance sheet at the fair value. As the investment is publicly traded, fair value information is readily available to determine the value of the investment. However, the amount of the appreciation or depreciation of the investment during the period of time does not factor into the calculation of regular net income. Instead, the amount is separately reported as other comprehensive income or OCI. Now, OCI is an income statement-like statement that is either separately presented or shown at the bottom of the regular income statement. OCI items are used to capture holding gains and losses relating to investments, hedges, and foreign subsidiaries. As these are typically longer term items in nature, the aggregation of these items separately in this account is intended to avoid creating any noise in the regular income statement until these items are ultimately realized. And realization often occurs upon the sale or the impairment of these instruments. Once again, dividend income is reported as regular investment income in the year incurred. Now, SECO is a strategic investment where Bob, through his PICO's investment, holds enough shares to significantly influence the strategic direction of the company. And in this situation, the equity method of accounting is appropriate. In applying the equity method, PICO picks up its proportion of the net earnings and loss and reports that as equity income. The offsetting entry increases the investment account on the statement and financial position. Secondly, any dividends received are recorded through the investment account. This avoids double counting income that would have already been included in the equity pickup in the earlier entry. Think of dividends like a return of capital when you're using the equity method. And thirdly, and perhaps the most challenging adjustment that is necessary because PICO has a different cost base for its SECO shares than the shareholders who bought the shares on the initial issuance. The difference here is called the Purchase Price Discrepancy, or PPD. It is calculated by comparing the implied value based on the price PICO paid for its shares to the net asset value as reported on the statement of financial position at the date of acquisition. The difference is attributed to assets or liabilities that have a fair value different than their carrying value. Depending on the nature of the difference, it may require additional amortization, as the situation is depicted here with the table on the right. PICO paid a $10,000 premium over and above the net asset value for the shares it purchased in SECO, presumably because the capital assets have a fair value that is greater than their book value. This difference gets amortized over the remaining life of the underlying assets, in this case, five years. The entry reduces the equity income and the investment account, which takes into consideration the fact that PICO has a higher cost base for its shares than does the original shareholders. DECO is again a strategic investment for PICO, and it should be classified as available for sale under IAS 39, as PICO does not exert significant influence. However, because DECO is a private entity and readily available fair value information, like a stock quote, does not exist, it will be carried at cost. The cost will be evaluated periodically for impairment. Otherwise, it will not change in value during the ownership of this investment while it is classified as an available for sale. Dividends would be recorded as investment income in the year earned. With the available for sale classification going away in IFRS 9, these sorts of investments may carry on in the not held for trading classification, but would have to be fair valued, presumably by using valuation techniques. Alternatively, they will be otherwise classified as fair value through profit and loss, 
with the unrealized gains and losses being reported through income. The accountant summarized his findings and prepared the financial statements for Bob. Notice how we have used the more traditional format for the income statement and the balance sheet. The various streams of income are reported on different lines depending on the investment classification. Dividend income is reported for the fair value through profit and loss and the available for sale investments. An unrealized gain is reported for the change in the value of the fair value of ACO. SECO, the equity investment, reports an equity pickup of $8. And finally, the $20 of other comprehensive income represents the unrealized gain on BCO. Now, Bob studied these numbers very carefully, trying to understand the performance of PICO's investment portfolio. Using the information provided by his accountant, Bob once again calculated his rate of return. However, he was unable to reconcile the information to his previous 10% return on investment estimate. Where did the 10% go? The accountant smiled and explained to Bob that the financial results are somewhat obscured by the different basis of accounting. Some of PICO's investments are reporting results based on fair value information, while others are using historical cost information. Bob was lost. Happily, the accountant patiently explained the phenomena. Fair value investments are those that are classified as either fair value through profit or loss or available for sale when there's a quoted price available under IAS 39. This means that the investment account on the statement of financial position should always reflect the best estimate of our fair value at the reporting date. Income received and the changes in value are also reflected through either the regular income statement or the other comprehensive income statement depending on the classification. Historical cost investments include those that are classified as either significant influence or available for sale when there's no quoted market price available. The significant influence investments are accounted for using the equity method. The available for sale investments are not adjusted for the appreciation or temporary declines in the value between the reporting dates. They are, however, marked down to the fair value if it's determined that an other than temporary impairment has occurred. Investment income is reported on the basis of the distributions received. Now it's important to note that this is going to be changing somewhat under the new proposed IFRS 9 standard, where the available for sale classification will go away for those investments that are in transition at the date of changeover, there will be this new not held for trading investment classification still available to continue to report unrealized gains and losses through OCI. However, note that even when the investment is sold, those gains will not get recycled through the traditional income statement, but would rather directly go to retained earnings. ACO and BCO are both fair value investments and the existence of the quoted price enables a mark-to-market -market adjustment at the end of each reporting period. Alternatively, CECO and DECO are historical cost investments. So with the first year behind, Bob looked forward to the second year with great anticipation. But the markets were volatile, the economy was fragile, and equity investors were being punished everywhere. Bob was not immune to the downturn. Let's review the investment decisions made during the second year. Early in the year, PICO sold its interest in ACO for $300,000, which is the same as its original cost a year earlier. PICO used $200,000 of the ACO proceeds to increase a stake in BCO to 20% from the 15% it held previously. And at the time of this further investment, the net asset values of BCO was $3.7 million, with any difference attributable to the fixed assets with a four-year remaining life. With this further investment, PICO was able to get Bob elected to the board of directors of BICO, enabling PICO to exert significant influence over the operating investing financing decisions of BICO. Now, SECO was negatively impacted, and severely so, during the downturn in the economy. Management has signaled to the shareholders that it will expect to write down many of its assets causing a huge paper loss. 
In other words, a non-cash charge against regular earnings. Deco, too, had its share of issues. Early in the year, the company cut its dividend, followed by an announcement that it was having difficulties refinancing debt that was due to mature. Finally, the company announced that it was initiating a strategic review process. Arising from the review was a valuation of the company at the year end, indicating that the equity value of Deco was $1 million. And sadly, so went the second year of operations. The changes to the initial investments and proceeds received have been noted on the chart as follows. The year-end results came in, which again Bob studied very carefully. And once again Bob prepared a table summarizing as best he could the performance of each investment in the portfolio. Once again, using PICO's percentage of income reported for each investment, Bob estimated that the return on investment was a negative 16% for the second year. He wasn't very happy. With his ego bruised, he sent the investment results to the accountant for an official tabulation. ACO, which had been previously classified as fair value through profit and loss, was sold during the year for $300,000. Even though the amount was the same as the initial investment in year one, the investment account was adjusted to fair value for the appreciation of the investment to $315,000. Thus, the difference between the carrying amount and the ultimate proceeds resulted in a $15,000 loss in year two. The accounting for BCO is complex because we must account for the change in the investment classification. Unfortunately, choosing an investment classification is not optional. Once significant influence is attained, the equity method of accounting for investments must be used. This is problematic because now we have shifted our investment accounting from fair value basis over to a historical cost basis. The first issue is how to value our existing 15% block as of the data transition to the equity method accounting. The answer to that is to adjust our first block of shares to fair value and report any gains or losses. This would include the $20 we reported in other comprehensive income previously in year one. Thus, our opening balance for the investment account under the equity method is the fair value of our holdings in BCO. Our equity investment pickup entry works the same as previously discussed, where PICO records its proportional entitlement to the earnings in BCO, which in this case are $53. The same holds true for the dividends received. The $27 of dividends received reduces the investment account to avoid double counting earnings and to reflect a distribution of earnings to the investor. The purchase price discrepancy works similar to what we had previously discussed, but note that we start with the purchase cost of the 5% ownership interest we just purchased. A $200,000 investment cost for a 5% of the outstanding shares implies a fair value of BCO of $4 million, which is greater than the net asset value of $3.7 million. This implies that PICO is paid more than the book value for the net assets of BCO. This difference must be adjusted for on the books of PICO. The implied purchase price discrepancy is $300,000, of which PICO shares based on his 20% ownership would be $60,000. This difference will be amortized over the remaining economic life of the underlying assets or liabilities for which it is attributed. Because BCO paid more than the net asset value, its returns will be lower than those reported by BCO shareholders to account for the purchase price discrepancy. The equity to record the purchase price discrepancy is to reduce the equity income and reduce the investment account. By the end of the year, BCO was trading it below PICO's carry value. Now we're going to assume that there was no impairment necessary at this time as the decline was a temporary decline. Otherwise, we would have to further write down our investment in BCO.
At the end of year one, Seco had an investment account balance of $103,000. And in year two, Pico's allocation of the net loss of Seco was $110,000. Now, Pico will pick up the equity loss to the extent that its investment account does not go negative. This is consistent with the equity investing model, which suggests that shareholders can only lose what they have invested. If PICO had made certain guarantees or financial commitments to continue to support SECO, then it would continue recording negative equity pickup above and beyond the amount in the investment account, but only in such circumstances. DECO would continue to be carried at cost throughout the investment holding period, unless indicators of an other than temporary impairment arouse. Each of the negative Events noted during the year are indicators of a potential impairment, including the dividend cut, the inability to refinance maturing debt, and the initiation of a strategic review. The business valuation provides us with an estimate of the fair value at the reporting date. Our 10% stake in the $1 million equity value implies that our ownership interest is worth $100,000 at the reporting date. Thus, it's necessary to report and other than temporary impairment charge against income for the difference between our 200000 carrying value at the beginning of the period and the $100,000 value at the reporting date. The accountant provides Bob with his annual financial statements. This time Bob is shocked to see a positive return on investment in such a horrendous year. The company received fewer dividends, sold its ACO investment for less than it was worth last year and saw its investments in DECO worth half of what it was last year. And what of BECO's decline? There's no sign of its value deterioration in the financial statements at all. This is truly odd indeed. At this point, Bob is befuddled. Bob suspects that this equity method of accounting is at the root of all complexity. And he asks his accountant why the equity method is necessary. Why can't he just track the fair values when that information is available, and when it's not, use the dividends recorded as a proxy? The accountant explains that the equity method is necessary any time an investor acquires significant influence. And the accountant provides a list of factors that need to be considered in evaluating and assessing whether the investor has significant influence, including consideration of the level of ownership control, once 20% of the equity interests have been acquired, it's common for the investor to have greater powers to exert influence. An ability to elect the members of the board of directors, whether it's exercised or not. Any rights of the investor or their designate to participate in the policy making processes. Any situations where there's a significant intercompany transaction between the investor and the investee entities, which is largely assumed to arise out of the ownership interest consideration of the size of the investor's ownership stake relative to other shareholders. The wider the distribution of shares, the greater an individual block shareholder has to influence the entity. And finally, to the extent that the investor and the investee exchange management and technology with one another, this too can give rise to significant influence. This explanation further frustrated Bob. Bob is a simple guy trying to execute a simple investment strategy. Bob's account suggests to him that there's alternative standards available for non-publicly accountable enterprises that may give him the results that he's looking for. For many countries, they have adopted differential reporting standards for small and medium-sized companies to help them relieve them of the complexity of some of those uh, more involved accounting standards. These little gap standards enable the entities to avoid fair value adjustments and equity accounting in certain circumstances. For the moment, Bob was pleased, but then as he thought about it more, he has big plans for Pico to grow this company. One plan he had in mind was to take Pico public to raise additional capital, which begged the obvious question, can he still do an IPO using these little gap standards? Unfortunately, the answer is most often you can't. Even if you get all the shareholders of the company to unanimously agree to use the differential reporting standards. Most often security regulators also have regulations that require listed companies to use a prescribed basis of gap. 
As we close this module, Bob is already looking ahead. Accounting for equity investments is just the beginning and deals primarily with minority ownership positions in other entities. At the other end of the spectrum, there are complete takeovers of target companies. And the accountant explains that this is called a business combination. And Bob has aspirations to not only participate at the board level, but to become active in management, as well as build a diversified public company. The accountant argues that PICO will begin consolidating the operating results of each of its subsidiaries and separately reporting segment information on each major business line. Bob also indicates a willingness to partner with others in using creative deal structures to pursue future strategic opportunities. The accountant explains that these sort of structures may result in joint ventures or special purpose entities. These structures are between the minority investments and the fully controlled investments, and they will often have their own accounting rules. We will look at many of these sorts of structures in the modules to come.